Good morning, church family. What a great day it is to be in the house of the Lord today. It feels great in here. It doesn't feel too great outside, but it feels incredible in here this morning. So a perfect place for us to go before the Lord in worship today. So uh, we're going to start off our service like we do each and every week. I invite you, if you are able, to stand with me as I pray. Let us go before the Lord as we prepare to worship Him with our whole hearts in this place today. Let us pray. Lord, we ask you this morning to move. We ask you to draw sinners to yourself. Would you draw those of us in this room who don't know you, would you draw them to repentance? Would you draw them to salvation, O God? Lord, we are asking you to do great things in this place. Would you speak through your word? Would you speak through this time of worship? Would you speak through this service today? May you be honored, glorified as we approach the throne with boldness and confidence today. Knowing you are good, knowing you are faithful, you are mighty to save. We believe that today. And we proclaim that back to you in song. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Let us worship him with our whole hearts together. Sing, don't lose heart. Don't lose heart, good on my soul, on my soul. Don't give up, there is hope, there is always hope. Storm in the storm, don't forget He is Lord, He is Lord of all. There is a King of glory, there is a God who saves, one who is strong and mighty, freedom is in His name. So open the gates of heaven, lift up a shout of praise. For there is a lion roaring, Jesus the King of glory. We lift our eyes. So lift your eyes, send it on, send it on. The King of glory, there is a God who saves, one who is strong and mighty, freedom is in his name. So open the gates of heaven, lift up a shout of praise, for there is a lion roaring, Jesus the King of glory. Nations bow, mountains shake, not the sound, just one thing, over all, Jesus reigns, I know. Let's sing that again, nations bow. Nations bow. Mountain shake at the sound, just one thing over all. Jesus reigns, I know. There is a King of glory, the very 
the King of glory. There is a God who sings, one who is strong and mighty. Freedom is in His name. So open the gates of heaven, lift up a shout of praise. For there is a lion roaring, Jesus the King of glory. We proclaim that this morning. If you would, turn to someone next to you. Greet them in the name of the Lord today. Welcome once again to Exchange. We sing this morning of this blessed assurance that we have in Jesus. We sing blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. There of salvation, purchase of
continue this morning. We're going to sing about the cross of Christ. Let us sing together. Hallelujah for the cross. Hallelujah that was, for the price that was paid for us so long ago. We would be hopeless without the goodness of God. We would be desperate without his love. Let us proclaim hallelujah for the cross. Shall ever be how marvelous. 
for your love and your goodness, and Lord, we pray that as we open up your word this morning, that you would speak through it. Would you use Pastor John today as he brings your word? And Lord, may you draw sinners to repentance. Lord, would you draw each and every heart in this room to yourself to honor you more and more and more and glorify you more and more and more with our lives. Lord, that is our aim. That is our purpose, is to bring you glory. Lord, we pray that we would do that in this time of worship today as we read your word. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Would you remain standing as Elisa reads from 1 Corinthians this morning? Now I commend you because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions even as I delivered them to you. But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, the head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head, but every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, since it is the same as if her head were shaven. For if a wife will not cover her head, then she should cut her hair short. But since it is disgraceful for a wife to cut off her hair or shave her head, let her cover her head. For a man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. For man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. That is why a wife ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman. For as woman was made from man, so man is now born of woman, and all things are from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a wife to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not nature itself teach you that if a man wears long hair, it is a disgrace for him? But if a woman has long hair, it is her glory? For her hair is given to her for a covering. If anyone is inclined to be contentious, we have no such practice, nor do the churches of God. Blessed be the reading of God's word. You may be seated. Will you pray with me? Lord, we thank you so much for this day that you've made. We thank you, Lord, for your word that is living and active, sharper than your two-edged sword. And I pray this day, O God, you would speak to us. Speak to us, O God, to help us understand the roles that you gave for us, the roles that you've ordained, God, in creation, 
Help us, O oh God, to love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, to love our neighbor as ourself. That, Lord, as we love you, we'll follow you, we'll trust in you, we'll obey you. And God, as we follow you, trust, and obey, God, would you help us to be a light in a dark place? For, Lord, you have given us an opportunity to be your witnesses. For, Lord, we come upon a section of Scripture that seems unique. And, Lord, I pray that you would speak to us this day, that you would show us the the intended meaning of this text, and we would apply it to our lives. For God, you have an opportunity to speak to us today, to help us ref be refined more into your image, to be your workmen and women in a broken and dying world. Father, I pray that you'd hide me behind your cross, that you would be glorified and honored and praised. And in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. So 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 2 through 16 is the text today. And so we are, normally this is a text on, on head coverings, um, but I think that kind of misses the mark on this, um, because yes, it talks about head coverings, and yes, it talks about uh, submission, and yes, it talks about the church, but really what we're getting at here is how do we honor God in a society. And so I just want to start by saying this. In Corinth, the garb of the day was different than ours. Do you realize that when you read most, whether it's Old Testament or New Testament texts, that most people wore dresses? So that's men and women? Most women wore head covering in Corinth. So what we're coming to is a time and a place that's way different from America. So you can't take your 21st century opinions and place it on this text and wonder, what is Paul talking about? You kind of have to dig in and say, okay, if men and women wore different things back in that Time, what is Paul talking about? And if they were to not wear what was culturally acceptable in that day and that time, what would they be communicating to the culture at that day, at that time? And so I just want to remind you, we've come off of a huge section of Scripture that talks about our freedoms in Christ. We are free in Christ to go. We are free in Christ to do. We are free in Christ. But all things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. So we have walked through chapters of seeing the reality that we can in Christ and have the liberty in Christ to go and to do, but it's not necessarily, necessarily profitable for ourselves. It's not necessarily profitable for our witness. And it's not necessarily profitable for our walk with Christ. So as we now live in that reality, not all things are profitable, but all things are lawful, how do we now go in church? Because there's still this mindset in the first Corinthian church, in this church in Corinth, that because there's this freedom, because there's this liberty, they now don't have to follow the cultural norms. Even in Corinth. So we'll get into this in a minute. But I just want to remind you, this is a new section, so we've kind of transitioned, but we can't pull this away from the context. So we've just come off three chapters of learning about our freedom in Christ, but how to limit and guard and control our freedom in Christ. We've been, it's, we've been having rails to run on. When God created the world, He created it with order, with function, with purpose. Every aspect of God's creation is good and has a place. When sin entered the world, sin entered the world when humans desired to function in a different role, with a different purpose than the one God gave. God gives roles to help us relate to Him and with each other. So the purpose of the sermon is to examine three roles that help us worship God 
and maintain our witness. Worship God and maintain our witness. Because we want to worship God, but we also want to do it in a way that doesn't hinder our witness. And so that's really been the culmination of the last three chapters. Yes, you have the ability to go and to do and to drink and to eat. Yes, you have all those abilities. But when you go and when you do, don't hinder your witness for the gospel. Yes, you can go and eat this. But hey, if those around you, if you have a weaker brother around you, don't hinder his walk with the Lord. Your witness. If you're at an unbeliever's house, don't hinder your witness. Why? Because we live to seek to glorify God. We seek to honor God. We seek to praise God in every aspect of our lives. So that even hits the church. So how does Paul start? Paul starts in verse 2 by giving them actually a praise. So let's just pause and think about this. How much is praiseworthy in this church to this point? We're in chapter 11. There's not been much praiseworthy. Uh, I know one pastor, he entitled his sermon series on 1 Corinthians, Good News for Bad Christians. Good news for bad Christians. Why? Because they weren't really walking with the Lord and they needed a lot of good news. But it was a lot of, I'm going to step on your toes and correct, correct you. Because you're not living properly for me. So he says this, now I commend you because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions even as I deliver them to you. So notice, the remember the traditions. They had good theology. They just had terrible practice. Good theology. Paul's not giving them, we have yet to go through a high Christology in the gospel or in, in 1 Corinthians. So he's not correcting them on, if you will, theological errors. He's correcting them on how you apply that theology to their life. Because you are a Christian and because you are a new creation, you should walk this way. Your life should look different here. Your life should look different here. So we've seen that over and over again. So he commends them, but now he's going to step on all their toes. So the first aspect of our sermon is this, the role of oneness. The role of oneness. And hang with me, because this will make sense, but just listen to it, okay? But I want you to understand, the head of every man is Christ. The head of the wife is her husband. And the head of Christ is God. We're going to pause right there. So uh, the reason I pulled out oneness is because Paul is very, very wise. And what he does here is we would, there would be no controversy throughout the church history if it just had read this. But understand that the head of every man is Christ, and then we skip that middle part, and the head of, every, and the head of Christ is God. Everybody in all throughout human, human history would say, oh yeah, absolutely. But we have this, the head of every wife is her husband. But notice what Paul does. He sandwiches that truth with the, the headship of God. So let's first start with the headship of God. Is God three persons? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Are the three persons of the Trinity equal? Absolutely. All God. All equal. So now, if that is our barometer, so our measuring stick, the oneness of God, the equality of God, the nature of God, God himself, are we talking about equality in marriage? No. We're talking about different roles. So there is, when you see the word submit in Scripture, and that's what's being talked about here. We are not talking about one individual in a marriage being of more value, one person having more, um, having being in, in, in a place that is more worthy. What we're talking about are roles and God given roles for the husband and the wife. Just as there are roles for God the Father. There are roles for Christ. There are roles for the Holy Spirit. There are 
roles for each, that does not make one lesser than the other. But rather, when they work together in unison, they're bringing glory to themselves. When a husband and wife work together in unison in the way that God prescribed, what are they doing? Bringing glory not just to themselves and walking in tune one to another, but rather what they are doing is they're giving glorify, they're glorifying God. So if you want to glorify God in your personal life and you want to glorify God in your marriage, now you look to the oneness of God. Because when you took on those marriage vows, the Bible says the two become one flesh. When you're talking with children about theology, specifically about the Trinity, this won't go much farther than elementary school, but it's okay. It works as an illustration. You can tell them, well, mom and I, we're two people, right? But what does the Bible say about us? We're one. And that's what it means in the Trinity, except there's two. Now that's going to break down, but we're trying to illustrate something that is a mystery to a toddler, to a young person. What we have here in the text is notice, the head of every man is Christ, the head of every woman is or wife is her husband, and then the head of Christ is God. There is submission and authority for all. We are all in a place of submission, and we are all in a place at different times of authority. How do we walk? In that submission, how do we walk in that authority? So we have oneness. And so in this oneness, Paul is highlighting the reality that in the church and in just the Christian walk, the wife does submit to her husband as the husband submits to Christ as Christ submits to the Father. So let's just think about this really quick before we move forward. On earth, Jesus Christ prayed, may you take this cup from me. But if you don't, your will be done. Right? So Christ was praying, I basically, I don't want to go to the cross. Take this from me. Ultimately, what he was saying is, I don't want to be separated from you, God the Father, because they have been eternally united, eternally one. But now the one who knew no sin was going to go to the cross to become sin for all humanity. And at that point when he took upon himself the sins of the world, that oneness was going to be lost. For that's what happened when he died. He laid his life down. He ended his life and was then separated, if you will, from God until he paid for the sins of the world. It says the wrath of God was laid upon him. Then he ascended and now is sitting in heaven at the right hand of God the Father. Does God the Father actually have a hand? No, he has no form. He's just sitting in the place of power on the throne, waiting for, waiting to return. So we have Christ, who submitted to the Father's will on earth. We have husbands who are to submit to Christ on earth. We have wives who are to submit to their husbands as they submit to Christ. And all are submitting to Christ and ultimately. God. But then Paul, after talking about oneness, the role of oneness, now is going to talk about the role of society. Look at verses 4 through 6 with me. Verses 4 through 6 of chapter 11. They say this, 
Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. But every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, since it is the same as if it were shaven. For if a wife will not cover her head, then she should cut off her hair. But since... It is disgraceful for a wife to cut off her hair or shave her head. Let her cover her head. So what we have here is this. In Corinth, every woman covered her head, her head with a veil. Not a veil over her face, but a veil over the top of her head. So what Paul is saying here is this. There is a veil that has been given in culture and society in that day. So what would be communicated in culture and society if it is the cultural norm for women to have a veil over their head, what does it now communicate for a woman to not have a veil on her head in the first century there in Corinth? It communicates, A, she's a prostitute. How would you want to say that you're open for business? Take the veil off your head. Open for business. Or if you were open to a relationship, open to be an adulterer, how would you communicate that to your culture? Take the veil off your head. So now you're communicating something that is lewd, that is sinful, but now we're in the church. So if now we come to the church and the church, because notice what it says, any man who prays and prophesies, right? Any woman who prays and prophesies. Notice what it doesn't say. Any man who prays and prophesies in the church. Any woman who prays and prophesies in the church. This is just generally praying and prophesying. But if someone is a Christian and they have liberty, and they say, in Christ I am a new creation, the old is gone, the new has come, I don't need to wear a veil, says the woman in Christ. If she walks around without a veil in the 21st century, or in the first century, what is she communicating to everyone else who's not a Christian? She's open for business or willing to commit adultery. So now is that having a hindrance on her witness? Absolutely. Paul is coming from a Jewish background. And I just want to remind you that for Orthodox Jews, do men have longer hair? And do men wear a head covering? If you don't know, they wear a head covering up here. And some of them have longer hair in this general area here. They allow their their sideburns just to grow. And they tuck them back. And the reason they have that is because there's a misunderstanding of when Moses came down, he saw the glory of God and his face shone. His face was glowing. And why did Moses cover his face? He covered his face because the glory of God was diminishing. The shine was diminishing, but he didn't want the people to know that the shine was diminishing. There's a misunderstanding there. It's Instead of thinking that the shine is diminishing, they think that, oh, no, I have to put a veil or something on the top of my head to now be holy as Moses was. But Paul is saying, so he's breaking away from a Jewish tradition that says men put something on their head. He's saying, don't cover your head, men. Don't do it. He's breaking away from a tradition. And women, keep your head covered. He's saying, don't break that tradition that's outside your culture because it's going to hinder your witness. It's going to hinder your witness. So men, keep your hair short, and women, keep your hair long. But let's not get caught up in the praying and the prophesying with your hair cut or covered. Notice what he's saying. Men and women, the role in the church, they can pray. Their roles, they can pray. 
They can prophesy. But how are they to do it? They are to do it in a submissive manner to God. We've seen the role of oneness. We've seen the role of society. Now let's see the role of creation. Verses 7 through 16. So let's examine what Paul now goes into. Will you look at verse 7 with me? For a man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. Now you might say, whoa, 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 what are you talking about, Paul? Well, look at verse 8. For man is, was not made from woman, but woman from man. So what Paul has just done there is he's harnessed back to Genesis when God created. And when God created, everything was good. Everything was perfect. Everything was well. And when he created, initially he created Adam. And he created Adam from the dust of the earth. And we all know the Imago Dei. We all know that we're made in the, we have inerrant value as humans because we're made in the image of God. But what Paul is saying is this man was made in the image of God, woman was taken from man, so from Adam's rib, and woman was made for man to be. His help mate. Praise God. With that, Paul is saying there are some now roles in that relationship. Because Adam was made first as the leader, as the one that, if you will, has the glory of God. He has to be the head. And as his wife, Eve, was made from him, on his side, from his rib, she now undergirds, supports, and helps Adam. I heard one pastor say when I was younger that any time his wife comes up to him and he puts his arm around her and she just kind of cuddles in, he says, welcome home. Because women were you know, taken from the side. Welcome home. You're right where you're supposed to be. But notice what Paul does. He goes to the role of creation. And the, uh, the ironic thing in society is not only does society reject God, they reject his role in creation. So as Christians, we harness back to what God did in creation and we use his work in creation to now direct our perspective. And so what, what Paul is saying here is this. He's saying that God made Adam first and God made Eve from Adam. That does not make Adam more valuable than Eve. It just gives Adam a different role. And how do we know that? Well, if you go on in the text, Will you guys look with me at verse 9 and following? Or verse 8. For man was not made for woman, but woman for man. Neither was, neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. That is why a wife ought to have a symbol of authority on her head sent because of the angels. Nevertheless, in the Lord, women, woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman. For woman was made from man, so man is, so man is now born of woman, and all things are from God. So we, we have an interesting conversation here in these next couple verses that we just read about creation. So Adam spent a whole bunch of time looking for a helpmate, and he found none. Do you remember that in Genesis chapter 2? Adam was going around naming a whole bunch of animals, 
looking for a partner, never found one. God put him asleep, took his rib, made Eve. He sees Eve and says, woman of my flesh. Basically, he says, wow. Praise the Lord. I've been looking for you. So Paul harnesses that God specifically designed woman for man, not man for woman, because man was made first, woman was made for man. But here's where it comes, highlights this point. But now man is born of woman. So originally... Woman was not made for man, but man was not made for woman, but woman for man. But now, no man can come, can be born except by a woman. So you see, we are dependent upon each other. And God has built this little ecosystem that he calls marriage, where a husband leads the wife, And he leads the wife, if you will, in a manner and a way that, as we know from Ephesians chapter 5, that is one of self-sacrifice, elevating her, washing her with the word for the glory of God. And as he does so, as he leads her, his wife submits to him. Why? Because the husband in in this manner is following Christ. So they're both following Christ. This is dual submission. And as they both follow Christ, as they both humble themselves in their own unique role, now we have equality in the couple. Because both are humbling themselves to follow Christ. Both are now dependent upon each other for procreation. Both need each other. Both play a vital role. My wife is pregnant. I am physiologically cannot carry a child. Can't do it. She can. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We will get to see this child in a couple weeks. Praise the Lord. God uniquely designed her in her role to have not only the ability to grow another human being in her body, but the ability to recover right afterwards. It's an amazing thing that he did. That's something I can't do. I am fully dependent upon my wife for that. So as she has been journeying the last nine months in this pregnancy, you better believe I'm seeking to lay down my life as Christ loved the church with foot rubs and ankle rubs and knee rubs. Serve, love, care. But am I still leading as I do that? Absolutely. Absolutely. But now this is coming all about praying and head coverings. But we're seeing this that is more than just praying and head coverings. This is, are we going to submit to God? Are we going to follow His way? I found it very interesting that we have this one verse here. It says this, verse 10. That is why wives ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. So in this section, Paul is going to shift. Paul is going to shift from a veil on your head to that you are, women are naturally given through creation a symbol of submission being their hair. So very generally speaking, through human history, I'm sure we had a, I'm sure we had some off liars here in the church, but generally speaking, women have long hair all through human history. Generally speaking, men have short hair all through human history. Now, I'm sure there are some hippies in the group, in the church here, who at one point in time may have had longer hair. But as you know, for men, 
Losing their hair is just kind of natural. Some of us are really working at saving their hair. Yours truly. But it's inevitable for men to actually lose their hair because of the testosterone in our body. As I was studying this, God has created us with testosterone, and the amount of testosterone actually speeds up the life cycle of a hair. Did you know that? And because of, it speeds up the life cycle of the hair, now it comes to dying a whole lot faster, so it won't regenerate, it won't grow again. That's why men lose their hair more frequently than women. Where in the, the flip side of the coin is God made women with estrogen, and estrogen keeps the life cycle of the hair going longer. So generally speaking, it grows, it dies, and it comes back for a longer period of their life than their male counterparts. And many of us in the room are showing that off today. So we have this order of creation where male baldness is just, it's going to happen, but it has no sign of glory. Whereas a woman, if someone shaved her hair, normally it is a sign of shame and guilt and demeaning because there's so much associated to her and her essence in her hair. So Paul is saying, yes, you have these veils in Corinth, but God by creation has given you a veil and that is your hair. Just as the angels have to submit to God. And as, if, as you read Hebrews chapter 1, we know that the angels know that there is a place of, they have a place of submission to God the Father. That they're in a place of service, that they're in a place to honor and follow Him. And so just as the angels are there to serve and care for and do the work that God has called them to do, the angels show the manner of submission that women are to have. And did you know that your hair could be a mark of that submission? So Paul just says this, and I'll just say it to you. Judge for yourself. Is it proper, proper for a woman to pray with her head uncovered? Does not nature teach you that if a man wears long hair, it is a disgrace to him? And he's just saying, generally speaking, men don't have longer hair. But if a woman has long hair, isn't it her glory? For her hair is given to her as a covering. If anyone is inclined to be contentious, we have no such practice, nor do the churches of God. So what are the takeaways of this? So in the 21st century, what are the takeaways? I would, I would suggest to you that in, in Paul's time, just as in our time, um, one, one reason the women of the church were seeking to take off their head coverings could be because there was just, you know, this we're equal moment movement going on. So we have like the feminist movement coming and is uprising. We have the transgender and LGBTQ movement going where they say there's a fluidity and God is saying no there are defined sexes and defined roles for sexes and it goes all the way back to creation so the question at hand for us is are we do we practically believe God's word or do we practically believe society do you follow what God's word says? That you were, whether you're male or female, created by God in your mother's womb. That God knit you together. That because you were created in your mother's womb, you have value. Intrinsic, meaning just being you has value. You have value. 
You have dignity. You're an image bearer of God. And so as a man or a woman, having not only that value, God, it says in his word, has ordained all of your days and knows all of your ways. So God has a plan for your life. And his plan for your life is to know him, is to follow him, and to do his will. That's generally speaking for all of us. Now, does it look different for each one of us? Absolutely. I am actively living out God's will in my life. You are actively, hopefully, living out God's will in your life. Our lives look very different. Praise be to God. This, my job would be very difficult if I had to lead a whole bunch of me. It would be very challenging. But God has made you for this moment, for this time, for this place to do his will and his work. But if you trust society, it says you can make your own destiny. You can do what you want. You can go where you want. And there's no ramifications for your choices. And God's word says, no, there's ramifications for your choices. If you reap, if you sow something, you're going to reap it. Not only is there ramifications, but there's consequences for your actions. And if your choices are sin, and you go away from his law and his way, there's punishment. So, my friends, church, are we willing to obey and submit as a church to God's will, God's way, or are we seeking to go our own way? Now, I know that for us in this place, sin has come in. So God has a standard, and he calls us all to walk by a standard. But then, when we walk out that standard here on earth, we are sinners. So you might say in your head, well, John, I don't want to submit to a man because men have failed me. Yes. Every woman in here knows that men fail them. And if we're honest, every man in here knows that they fail. Not only do they know that they have failed, they know that their dad failed them. So when we approach God's standard and it's God's way and he's commanding us, know this, the barometer, the measuring stick, is never your experience. Because if you say that I am only going to follow God's will, God's way, if I have experienced something good here on earth, you're not going to obey very long. But if your standard is Jesus Christ, can I remind you, he lived the perfect sinless life. This means God, the eternal, second part of the Trinity, Christ was willing to put on human flesh and become, be given a human name, Jesus. So it's really the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not, he doesn't have a last name, Christ. That's a title. That's a distinction. Jesus is his human name that Mary gave him. But Mary only gave it to him because God told her to give it. He walked perfectly on earth. And I hear, want you to hear me. Jesus fully obeyed God's command. He loved everyone. He loved perfectly. He spoke perfectly. He never broke a command. That is why I say I would have hated to have been his brother because it only would have made me look more sinful to have the perfect example right in front of me. Jesus is our measuring. So for men in the room, we have to be like Jesus. For women in the room, you don't obey just because your husband obeys. No, you be obey because God has told you and Christ obeyed. So now, you're obeyed. Husbands obey because Christ obeyed. So our head is Christ. So no matter what we've experienced, no matter the hardship, no matter the sin, we always turn back to what would Jesus do? 
Well, he followed the will of God perfectly, even to go to a cross and to die for sinners such as you and me. How much more are we to lay down our life to follow him? So are you willing to humble yourself and follow Christ? Or are you willing to think of yourself as better than God to follow the world? We have an opportunity to be the light of the world. But to be the light of the world, to be a city on a hill, we must be men and women who seek to live out that light each day by following God. And by following God, you have to humble yourself, turn to Him each day, submitting to His will, His way. To be a living sacrifice. Giving yourself, all of you, to Him. That's what it looks like to have a relationship with God. If you're here today, you've never given your faith you never placed your faith in Christ. You've never given your life to Jesus Christ. I want to give you an opportunity to do so. Believing in Jesus Christ will, yes, save your soul for all eternity, but it will change your life here on earth. Our God is the King of Kings. He's the Lord of Lords, and He is returning one day. And when He returns, Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's what it says in Revelation. Which means this, the truth will be revealed when He returns. But that when that truth is revealed, when He shows His authority, when He shows His power, when He demonstrates it in that way, it's going to be too late for salvation to come. Because He won't be coming back to save in that point, in that time, he'll be coming back to judge the world of sin. And I don't know about you, but I know I'm a sinner. And I need, I needed someone to pay for my sin debt. And the longer I'm a Christian, what God does through his spirit is he only reveals to me the more and more I am a sinner. And how much more dependent I am on Christ. I need Him and rely on Him more today than I ever have before. And He saved my soul. I depend on Him to walk with Him, to talk with Him, to know Him, to follow Him, to obey Him. you're here today and you've never placed your faith, placed your trust in Jesus Christ, may today be the day that you do so. Because Jesus is coming back and you will have to account for your sin. And the Bible says that the wrath of God is coming upon those who have sinned. Meaning that you need a Savior. And I don't know about you, but if I can learn from people who have gone before, learn lessons that don't have to come my way, I try to live a life of wisdom and follow the example of others. Jesus rose from the dead. Jesus is alive in heaven. And Jesus will be returning. We can learn... From Jesus, we can learn from the disciples who all were willing to die for the truth they knew in Christ. Yes, there's much that you have to put your faith and trust in to believe in Jesus Christ. But it's much easier to have that faith than to live. your own way. Making your own choice and living with the consequences. Trusting in God or trusting in yourself.
when you trust in God, His yoke is easy, His burden is light, because He has taken it on. So if you're here today and you've never placed your faith and trust in Christ, may today be the day of salvation for you. If you're here, you've never been baptized. I love to be honored to baptize you. We have three baptisms next week. It's going to be a celebration. I'd love to baptize you. If you'd like to join our church, come on down. We need you here at Exchange to do the mission that God has called us to do here locally, nationally, and around the world. To love God and love others for the glory of God, the good of the city, and the salvation of souls. And maybe you need prayer. You find yourself in a place that is just distressing challenge. I'm here. The altar is open for you to pray. Will you stand with me? Father, we thank you for your word that is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, and I pray this day you continue to move in this time of response. God, I thank you for your word, and I ask and pray that you would help us to see your oneness and how your oneness has different roles while there's still equality present. And so God, as we look into the different roles of husbands and wives, men and women, Father, I pray that we would see the reality that there are, yes, different roles, different actions, different things that you have ordained, but God, I pray and ask that you would show us and remind us that we are all equal. For Lord, we are all equal at the foot of the cross. We have all sinned and fallen short. And we all need Jesus. Every human who has ever lived needs Jesus. And in the church, Father, we are co-heirs with you, with Christ. And so Lord, I pray that, that we would see the reality that there is no distinction, no male, female, slave, slave and free. Gentile and We're all one with you. Lord, I pray that we would walk and talk and know you. That we would be your ambassadors here in this world to do your work and your will. Oh God, may you continue to move in this, in this time in the of Jesus. Everyone needs compassion. Love that's never failing, let mercy fall on me. And everyone needs forgiveness, kindness of Savior, the hope of nation. And I say. God is mighty to save, He is mighty to save, forever, author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the grave.
to conclude our service today with a couple of announcements that you need to know about. First and foremost, uh, on our way out today, you will have the opportunity to give tithes and offerings. Let us continue to remain faithful as we give to the mission that God has set before us as a church family. So there will be an opportunity for you to drop offerings and tithes in the offering plates on your way out today. We also have a tab on our, on our website at exchangeokc.org that you can select give there and you can give online that way if you prefer that method of giving. Uh, also, a few exciting announcements about the week ahead. First and foremost, this upcoming Tuesday night at 6.30 p.m. is going to be our women's ministry, Pickleball, Pictionary, and Pizza. Uh, I can't believe I got that correct. Did I get it correct? Mm -hmm. oh, I, I got it a little backwards there, but I, I didn't stutter on it, so I'll, I'll call it a success. Uh, but that'll be this Tuesday at 6.30 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. So there is a sign-up sheet out in the hallway for that. So if you're interested in attending, sign up and let them know that you are going to be there. Next week is a very, very, very exciting week for our church. This next Sunday, uh, July the 24th, we are going to be having our deacon ordination and commissioning service. It will be during the morning worship service this next Sunday. So church family, I, I implore you to be here next Sunday. It's going to be a great, great day. And I mean it when I say a very special day for our church as we ordain and commission these deacons who we have selected to serve our church body. So be here next week. Make it a point, make it a priority to be here next Sunday for that service. It's going to be an awesome, awesome day. And we also have baptisms to celebrate that day as well. So it's going to be a joyous day for our church. Next week, July the 25th through the 28th, uh, Lenexa Baptist Church is going to be here with us, and they're going to be putting on a soccer camp in the Will Rogers Courts. There's a sign-up form on our church website if your child is interested in being a part of that. It'll be in the morning, so it won't be too, too insanely hot yet. So it'll be from 9 a.m. to 11.30 each day in Will Rogers Courts. If your child's interested, you can sign them up online uh, or bring them there that day. That'd be awesome. We're looking forward to hosting that. In the month of August, uh, we have an exciting change that's coming to our church in the month of August. Uh, we have the opportunity as a church family to uh, step up and uh, lead out in our church's food pantry. Uh, for the last three years, we've been partnering with Graceway Baptist Church in our food pantry, and they have helped to make that food pantry possible on the second and the fourth Mondays of each month. The Lord has moved in a way that has led us to a point where we now as a church are going to step into that leadership role of the food pantry and uh, kind of be independent in running that on our own. Uh, we are initially going to be uh, working alongside with Southern Hills Baptist Church as they help provide for us to make sure that we don't miss a beat in our food pantry during this transition. So during the month of August, that's going to be our first opportunity as a church to step up and lead out in that food pantry. That'll be on Monday, August the 8th, the first food pantry under uh, the exchange umbrella. So we are excited about that, uh, but that also means as we take leadership roles in this food pantry that we need your help. So as we kind of branch off into this new season of ministry for the, our food pantry, we want you to be a part of that. Our goal is to not just share food with those in need, but to share the gospel with those who need it, those who are in need of a Savior. So that is our goal, and we want to see our church step up in that. So I encourage you, if you are interested, we have a whole food pantry transition team that has been working really hard to make sure this transition goes smooth, 
we would love to get you involved in our food pantry. Come see our staff for more information regarding that. We'll get you involved as we move toward the month of August. So exciting things happening in our church, and we look forward to seeing how uh, the Lord's going to use these things and how he's going to continue to move, plug in into our church in the weeks to come as we seek to love God and love others for his glory. I invite you to stand with me. I'm going to pray for us, and then we will be dismissed for the day. Lord, we thank you for your goodness and your mercies that are new each morning, and we pray that as we go today that we would recognize the importance of unity, that we would recognize the importance of being obedient to you and your calling. And Lord, may we bring you glory with our lives. We love you, O Lord. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Have a wonderful Sunday afternoon, everybody. Oh